Thanks, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, I think we're going to start off with a brief presentation from each of our panelists here. And I think, Robin, you're going to get us started with the first video and talk. So go ahead. Testing. There you go. Well, as we say in Texas, howdy, everyone. And we've got some serious things to talk about. Um, disasters are huge. We had just last year over 400 worldwide, 31,000 lives lost, can't even count the long-term impact on health uh, and deaths from there. And in terms of dollar economic amounts, over $220 billion US dollars in direct economic costs, not the long-term cost. So you're probably wondering where are the robots and the AI? And your first thought, I think when most people think about robots and drones right now because of the, the, uh, the conflict in Ukraine, that it's all about drones as bombs. But there's so many things I want you to walk away with that drones, robots have been used for disasters since 2001. And here's an example of how recently drones have been used They've been used since 2005 for disasters. Uh, this is the largest collapse, structural building collapse in the United States. It was in Miami Beach. This is drone footage. Uh, drone teams were brought in and the collapse happened at 1.23 in the morning. Immediately, Miami-Dade Fire Department started using drones with spotlights to start searching the pile and realized it was a bigger collapse than they expected. Florida State University, a part of the team I'm with, flew 280 drone missions. That's a 3D reconstruction just from the cameras on a $1,000 drone. Okay, look at the data products though. So now it's no longer the brilliant advances in AI for autonomy and navigation, but now it's further processing to reason about volumetrics, to reason about GIS and where things are. So it's a great future of AI and drones for disasters and similar stories for ground and marine vehicles. Excellent, all right, thanks very much. Dario, you gonna follow up? Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's see if the presentation comes up. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's me, thank you. And uh, there should be some slides. <laughs> That's Robin, great, fantastic. So thank you for joining us during the lunch breaks. My laboratory does research in bio-inspired drones, and in particular, as you can see in this artistic rendering, we are interested in making drones fly through buildings and confined spaces. And then it turns out to be a very interesting, uh, I mean, disaster mitigation seems to be a very interesting application of, of this technology. Now, this is a, a, a sort of a rendering of a disaster scenario that Robin very nicely earlier on showed the problems. And some of the drones that we develop in, in my lab, for example, are typically used for inspection, as you can see here. You can have other drones presented this morning and demonstrated that can fly through confined space and roll through the rubble. So they are used for inspection of confined spaces. And then you can have even the drones that transport, for example, emergency goods to people. Uh, you can have drones for establishing communication networks uh, in situations where the typical infrastructure is no longer available. And you can even have small drones that fly in swarms through the uh, environment. But we should not forget the rescuers. So the rescuers need to be in control of all of this. Yes, they like to have autonomy. They want to have a, a mainly data in, and awareness of what helps there. And so recently we have been investing quite a lot on making drones more a more immersive experience for anybody without going through a training and we studied for a long time and developed infrastructure that you can put in your body anybody with no experience in one minute can fly a complicated drone with first person view just using natural motion of the body i believe the future stands here using swarms now drones have become a commodity using swarms of drones for augmenting human awareness, but in a natural way. And the questions here are, how can we broadcast multimodal, multidimensional information from a swarm to a single human and let a single human give commands to a swarm that has local intelligence? So this is a big question mark, which I think will be useful also for disaster mitigation. Great, that sounds very exciting. Dom? 
thank you for that, Dario. And let's see if we get this to load up quick. Here we go. So my name is Dominic Romano. I'm the founder of DrainPipe.io, and I'm a contributor of AI for Radiology to um, the uh, ITU and WHO focus group AI for Health. And what we're going to be speaking about um, today and what our, our panelists so far have spoken about is you have the, the world's leading deployer of solutions to save lives, um, and then you have one of the world's leading researchers in the actual devices which are deployed and save lives. Now, when these devices are deployed during a natural disaster response, there's uh, immense communication struggles because the amount of data that has to get collected and transported, um, sometimes over large distances, is immense. And you have additional struggles of there not necessarily always being available communication infrastructure given the, uh, you know, the scenarios of a natural disaster. So, um, you know, it, when thinking about these problems, we want to think about first, you know, when you deploy all these devices, we need to uh, worry about our communication infrastructure, which also relates very much so to the, uh, the SDG impacts where, like for example, in, uh, in December we had a, a, a focus group uh, session in Douala, Cameroon, and the, uh, the post for the, uh, the lady minister of the communications post of Cameroon, uh, she actually uh, disconnected in a call with the United Nations during a, um, a session with us. And so if countries today are still struggling to have solid uh, telecommunications infrastructure, then you know, that only makes the, the disaster response process that much harder. And that's something that we have to be cognizant of. Now, as we collect all of this data uh, throughout a, a natural disaster response, um, we, we also have to assign meaning with it. So it's important that we have systems in place that can connect all of this data from all these different devices, get it to the people who need it most, and um, allow for them to be able to make sense of what that data is in order to um, more effectively respond to these emerging situations. Um, now, it's also really important that we collect what we know about these situations that have unfolded also in the past and to drive uh, new ways of informing our devices um, and our responses to be able to save lives in the future. And uh, what you see here is an example, a rendering of a uh, nighttime search and rescue where we are training a uh, computer vision model to detect um, when there's a person present in the scene. And so using uh, simulation um, can drive preparedness. However, there are a multitude of factors which uh, we'll probably be speaking about as well. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Don. Uh, so one thing I think that is common among all your presentations is that the, the state of technology is actually quite advanced, right? Like it seems like we've achieved a lot. Uh, there's still obviously progress to be made and you're at the cutting edge of the progress that is being made, but what we can do right now technologically is quite impressive already in terms of the amount of data we can collect, what we can do to process that data. So what are the remaining challenges? What are the biggest obstacles now when it comes to actually deploying and using uh, robots in disaster response scenarios? I'll take a stab at some of the questions. So drones have been used since, as an example, since 2005, Hurricane Katrina. Yet in the United States, they're still considered an ad hoc resource. And that's because the adoption cycle is very top down, very policy driven, and very hard to get, get through. And that's why the importance of things like this, where policymakers can start seeing what are the issues, what's the possibilities, what are the barriers. We see that also responses are not a single military, one person in charge, and they have this and they have that. It's bottom up, lo localities, local agencies, at least 20 different agencies will be involved. Some of them will have drones and now how to coordinate. And that gets into issues, privacy, what can they share, who's in charge, 
these things need to be worked out. So it's no longer a technology problem, it's a people problem and understanding the workflows and then if we can find, if these agencies can understand where the barriers are, then, then we can make systems that will work together and effective dashboards. Policy is not uh, responsive to the actual nature of what the situation is and what the capabilities are right now. So you're basically, the, the task now is for policymakers to work hand in hand with response teams, with responders to understand what is actually happening and what needs to be cleared and changed and adapted in terms of policies for on the ground. I think that's true. I'm going to add just a little bit. I see the role of academics as developers and innovators that we have not been good midwives. We have not stepped to the plate uh, with exceptions like you and your programs. You know, Switzerland has been a leader of getting things into the field. We've not done a good job of explaining what we do. We've done a great job of hype in declaring things. We've not done a good job of thinking through some of these things and helping these responders and policymakers understand what's possible, what's reliable, what works, what and what are the downfalls that they need to be aware of. And Dario, you're much closer to the metal, I would say. But are you are you having these? Do you have these conversations? Do you think about the regulatory and the policy side? Yeah, definitely. I think I completely agree with Robin. So our, uh, I talk as an academic, but uh, our role is behind, be, beside doing research is to establish a communication and inform the rescue teams and the regulators what we can do. In Switzerland, maybe because it's a small country, we are quite uh, fortunate that they try to understand what we can do before trying to regulate it. Whereas in other countries in Europe, for example, they first put rules and then, you know, uh, and that's a problem. Uh, the second thing is that, uh, as uh, Robin was saying, for the past 10 years, we have an event. Next one is happening next week, actually, where we have all the rescue teams, uh, different type of forces, fire brigades, nuclear emergency response, that come together with researchers and companies uh, that develop robots, and they try to understand what each other needs and each other d can do. And this has been going on for the past 10 years, and we start to see some of the technology being deployed. But I think the second challenge is that, that you were, I would like to raise here is that as academics or researchers, there is only so much we can do yeah. for these things. And then what the real impact happens is when you have a company, when you have a product that can go down there. And as we were briefly touching, uh, discussing before this session is, the problem is that I'm not sure this is a, a business. I'm not sure that there are companies that can grow and raise funds uh, for disaster mitigation, also because the rules and regulations are so diverse. And so the question is, how can you tap, how can disaster mitigation forces tap on technology that today is developed for other purposes by companies? Right. And, and that is a little bit of still an ad hoc sort of situation. Well, and that, when you were demonstrating the various types of drones and also the swarm intelligence, like you're obviously thinking about disaster response as a possible endpoint, like a use case, but that's not your primary, like you're the, in the envision, you're not envisioning that as the primary customer of those things when you're thinking about Well, it. actually, to be honest, when we, write, when we write the grant proposals for raising funds, we say that's our end user, our disaster mitigation. Of course, we have scientific questions in mind, how we, and then, we, but, but we always think that there's some practical aspect, and so I was fortunate that my collaborators funded two companies that and their drones have eventually been used uh, for disaster mitigation. But the primary business of the company is inspection of uh, large outdoor spaces or inspection of indoor confined uh, uh, structures. Uh, but, they, but they do come to disaster mitigation um, uh, exercises. Yep. And I think the key word there is mitigation. So we're seeing there's no money in response. It's a low volume, low profit industry. But what's, what you start seeing is there is more interest in land use, uh, preventing floods. There's much more interest in those things, and you're tapping into to that, as well as recovery. Insurance companies are getting much more into it. So we are beginning to see a bit of a business model. Well, uh, depressingly, as your other slide pointed out, there's increasing frequency and number of disasters, right? So that kind of helps with scale maybe, unfortunately? The disasters, according to the, the things, aren't increasing in number so much as they're increasing in severity. And part of that is, is because of poor land use choices. 
and the impact is much higher, right? The urbanization that we've seen in cities means there's a lot of vulnerable areas, uh, poor land use choices, but, but vulnerable populations. And so they get hit harder. The impact of a disaster and the long tail of recovery is much worse. So, yeah. And Dom, you can definitely speak to the economic impact. You're a private company trying yeah. to make money. Right? So one thing I would add is that these systems are growing. Uh, the workflows that you need uh, are really growing in complexity. And so you know we have different legislation that's coming down for like privacy on drones that actually make it a lot harder to process that data on site. Um, and it requires a lot more com computation um, to be able to actually process this information and get it to where it needs to go. Um, and uh, as far as on the, uh, the company side, right, it, it really just comes down to finding commonalities where, um, you know, a, a technical capability serves, you know, one vertical and then also addresses the, uh, you know, one or two different things in, in a natural disaster response, right? So logistics is one, um, you know, uh, data management is another. So there's, you just have to find the right verticals that match and, and then just kind of bring them together and deliver the solution. Yeah, I think when you were demonstrating some of your technologies back in, like you had some things in there that were like tracking uh, hate speech on like social platforms or something, right? But your, your model can be applied to that as well as to emergency site so, analysis. So yeah, because as, as a situation is unfolding, you have, um, you know, you have a situation that, that, that happens, but you need to also maintain a common operating picture of the uh, unfolding events. And in order to do that, you have to assign meaning to data in order to turn it into information. And um, in doing that, that will build out your common operating picture. And it also allows for multiple systems to be able to interact on a common uh, framework of ontologies, um, which is very helpful for um, when situations are moving rapidly and you need to get that information to other people and they need to understand what it is that they're, that they're looking at. So another area I wanted to touch on that Robin, you and I were talking about a lot before was uh, implementation of a lot of these technologies, and especially novel technologies, um, and the challenges there that people might not think about or realize, and how emergency responders are thinking about these things, and what systems they rely on, and what their instincts or um, you know their training has led them to do in scenarios. Well, emergencies are emergencies. Right. They're fortunately they're locally rare, right? You you, you may have hundreds worldwide, but when it's happening to you, it's an emergency, it's off normal, so you already have stress from that. It's a cognitive load. You're doing things differently by, by definition. So you don't, from a cognitive science capacity, don't have extra CPU cycles to deal with anything new. So think about it like you're driving down, trying to find a new place. You've got somebody saying they can't find directions. You're looking, traffic's bad, and this is not the time you add a new app. Right? You just try to make through with what it is and try not to yell too much at each other. Right? Maybe slow down, things like that. So we see the same thing. We see people come, oh, here's an app. You know, you have to, here we've got a new solution. It's an app. We're like, you know there's no, if it's a hurricane, there's no wireless. It takes 12 hours before that gets restored. And then like apps, how many of you bought a, an app from the App Store, 99 cents? You, it doesn't work within 15 minutes, so you never open it again? Same with us, right? So those are some of the things there that we see. We see often people are calling a governor to get their technology there. It, this can do things. It's an innovation push. But what we really see the need is, it's a demand pull. I need, as a responder, to solve the problem I have now, the need for data, the need to act at a distance, see and act at a distance for this. It's got to be directly related to my needs. I don't have time, sleep, cognitive ability to deal with anything new. And worse yet, I may lose my job. Right. No one's ever right. going to fire me. I'm not going to lose my government pension for doing it the way we did the last one, a training. But if I take a new super duper robot or drone and it screws up somehow or violates privacy or there, then I lose my job and my pension. So that's not fair. Yeah, and like, it makes sense, right? Because in emergency situations, we are wired essentially biologically to be conservative and 
for good reason, right? But d Daria, do you think about this a lot when you're doing new product development? Like how do you build entirely new models or objects or drones when the tendency for the people using them is to shy away from them? Yeah, I completely agree on this. So that's our next effort is to make the use of this technology more intuitive. So you just give you know commands, go tell me if there is a person over there, you know, and then deploy the drone for that. And I do not command anything. I just get information within the next few minutes. Um, at the same time, I was looking at Reuters uh, recently at an infographics about the collapse uh, of the earthquake in Turkey. And I look at the tools that these rescuers have. And there was a full page of all sorts of tools. I wouldn't know where to start. The, you know, what I use and what, and it's a matter of training. So this, these machines are relatively low tech. They work well in all time, and then these rescuers are trained to use them. So they know, oh, now I need that. This is what I'm gonna use. And so we go back to what we started at the beginning. These rescuers need to get the most robust technology and need to know how to use it. I think that's part of it. Great. So we unfortunately are over time. <laughs> it's a great discussion, and I'm sure you'll be available if people have additional questions uh, after this. But thanks very much. Thank you.